That's a really cool song by uh, Miho Fujiwa called Streets Are Hot, which you can enjoy for yourselves later. Okay, so Gunsport is a video game, so we're pretty sure. And the way that you play it is you've got these two positions on two teams. There's a team on the left, a team on the right. And that there is a keeper. And they don't move, and they have two shots. And they have a wider range of aiming. They can aim all the way up to all the way forward. And then the, the ones in the front can move and jump, but they only have one shot and they uh, are more offensive and they cannot aim all the way up, so there's just kind of a little complement between the two of those. And that's the basics of the game. Uh, as, well, <coughs> as But also, every time the ball crosses the net toward you, you auto-reload, um, so you're not stuck with one or two shots forever. And every time the ball crosses the net either direction, it's worth an extra point. So if you have a volley of 10, the ball's worth 10 points, and it sort of naturally adds to the tension, because the longer the ball is in the air, the more it's worth, and the more dangerous it becomes to lose it. <coughs> and we were kind of inspired by a variety of games. Uh, the initial spark came from this uh, top game called Dog Patch, which was a very obscure arcade game from uh, made by Midway in like 1978, I think, and it's about two hillbillies in the American South shooting a tin can back and forth, and you can see they've got like their, their food ladies up there and everything. Um, it's really uh, crass art for an actually pretty cool game. Um, <clears throat> then Windjammers on the bottom left, that's one of those first games that really distilled the act of sporting into just arcade stuff. And I, I guess Pawn did that as well. But in a modern setting where you can actually tell what everything is, and it's not just um, uh, symbolic graphics, but representational. <clears throat> and then this is kind of a similar sort of uh, view to ours that's super valuable by a video system. So with these kind of games in our minds, it, like I really wanted to make Dog Patch was the thing that excited me and made me feel like we have to make something that, that extends this idea forward. <clears throat> so the first prototype was just a prototype to see if we could make a thing. There's not much to it. Um, the second prototype has goals that you can shoot into. Uh, the goals on the top are worth less than the ones on the bottom. And you see that it says balls left 16 up there because at this point we were figuring out win-loss conditions and so we figured that you have 20 balls and at the end of that whoever has the most points they win. But this actually uh, caused some problems. Um, we already had the idea that the more the ball goes back and forth crossing the net the more it's worth. So it was possible to get an extreme lead in this game, like if you would if you're 50 to 10, or something like that, at that point, you have no more incentive to play because if the ball, if you just let the ball go, the other person can only get one or two points at a time, and then you can just win in the length of possible. So we had to fix this. Uh, in the next prototype, as we were trying to figure it out, we just put balls left to 9999 and just played forever. And we added these mouse robots, as my friend in Japan likes to call them, pejoratively. Um, so then we added the fourth, the, the, the four characters total, so you got the, the, the mouse robots in the back that have that, that aiming, just like in our current prototype. This, this is basically the full game at this point, uh, without the graphics. And the UFO head guys have lasers, and they can jump. And as you see at the top there, we did a score to win which solved our previous problem of um, imbalance with, with the scoring, because in, with the, uh, the volley thing, even if, you were, even if your opponent is one point from winning, all you have to do is continue to not lose, and you can get big points. Uh, we, we saw at the Rooster Teeth Expo, there was one volley that was 43 points, 
Um, and it, it was basically the fourth, the fourth ball that had been in play at all, and it decided the, the full match because it was, uh, you can get the points up that high. Um, so yeah, this was basically the game already, but we wanted to pitch it to publishers, and so we had to put in actual art. Uh, this was put together in about two weeks, um, and we also added a thing called the ace, which is, so we noticed that in playing this game with people, sometimes one side would be having a really bad time, they wouldn't be able to figure out how to play very well, and the other side would be really good, and the experience would be bad for both people. And as kind of a stopgap, we decided to add something where if you shot the ball straight into the net, the net would, uh, into, rather into the goals, the goal would be worth double points. And we figured, okay, this at least will make the people that are good at the game have a good time. So at least we've solved half the problem. But it actually solved more problems than we thought because that sort of dynamic thing where you totally know that you're getting scored on made people want to try harder. So the people that were doing worse actually, whereas before this was added, uh, people who weren't doing very well would just be like, yeah, thanks, okay, bye. And they would just put the controller down and walk away. Now I was seeing people who were not very good at it feeling like, okay, let's do another round now that I hit this. And that was an unintended and very happy side effect. And here, uh, you, you saw in this, in this last one, there's that Mohawk guy on the far left. We exchanged him for this Mohawk lady because she fit better with the, the Oakland team. That's the Oakland team over there on the left. Um, and that, that turned out to kind of maybe be an important change later. Um, we also added these laser sights. You can see it coming from the blonde lady uh, from her gun there. That was an indicator of how many shots you have left. If it's red, you have one. If it's, two, uh, if it's blue, you have two. And if it, there's nothing, then you have no shots. It also kind of helps people find the ball uh, a little easier. And we added a second stage as well, where the goal is open and close, and a focus shot, which is when both teammates shoot the ball at the same time, then the ball goes twice as fast. And this added more of a team dynamic thing, because you've got to shoot the ball at, within like very few frames. And it feels really good every time you do it, and it kind of hypes everybody up. So now I want to talk about the UI stuff. Um, our UI was really bad at first. Uh, it was just totally placeholder. And then we changed it, it or, or like the HUD, uh, for example, um, was placeholder. And then it became these actually floating things in the world, which will be customized to each stage. Uh, but more than that, Actually, the character select screen was really important, a lot more important than we thought. Um, at the beginning, it was just this, which is obviously just basic utilitary stuff. Um, and then with the fifth prototype, we let you actually see who you are going to be and what the position is. But it was still kind of confusing because you had to choose everything at once with, without any real knowledge of what's going on. And the um, you had to use the left stick to choose your character, and not every character uses the stick, which I'll explain in a moment. But that was uh, kind of important that we change. So uh, in our final prototype, we split everything apart. This allowed me to teach players how to play the game as they were going through the menu. So what I would say, I'll, I'll actually tell you the control scheme right now because that's important as well. <clears throat> so I would say you can choose two players or four players using the right and left trigger on your controller. Um, and then you would go through those screens and then select your team again with the triggers because ultimately you're using the triggers and the X button on the Xbox for the square on the PlayStation. But triggers and fire are the two important things. And so you would use triggers to select your team and then hit fire to advance. And then choosing your position, and here I would explain the defensive 
properties of the keeper and the offensive properties of the striker so that people would know what they were doing. And then we added some nice little screens that would smash together with sparks and stuff and it um, attracted people a bit more. Cool graphics. So then we have this demo. Um, so again, triggers aim the gun up and down and X fires. And this is like a weird control scheme that a lot of people weren't used to, but that was actually a really big benefit for us, as again, I will explain later. But this old demo here has really flat backgrounds. I don't know if you can tell, but there's not a lot of depth to it. So th this is the new kind of not finished uh, Tokyo stage, which has actual depth and perspective and things. <clears throat> so next part, we forced everybody to play this game. Uh, everybody that came by, no matter who they were or how reluctant they were, because while we'll have an on online mode later, right now the game is entirely uh, <coughs> single screen, everybody's got to be in the same place. So in a trade show setting, someone would walk, walk by with a significant other who didn't want to play, and I would be like, well, sorry, you have to, we don't have enough people, you have to play, sorry. And then they would do it. Um, and that actually worked out super well, uh, because we found that a lot of different people, different kinds of people could play this game very well. Uh, and especially um, older people and younger people, which was a surprise. So we had a lot of parents and kids, we had a lot of couples, and uh, we had a lot of just young people. Th those young people down there at the bottom were especially into this game. They're all trash talking, and but in a super positive way. And it, I don't know, it felt it felt like a different thing because they weren't they weren't thinking about the dynamics of who should be good at this game, and who should be bad at this game. They were just going for it. Let me see if this if this video will work. It was a little fine. I took with those kids. <laughs> Um, and older people as well. Uh, this is Carol Shaw on the right side of the screen. She wouldn't like being called an older person. But um, she's, let's, let, shall we say, not in her 30s anymore. And uh, she came over to me at, at the Media Indie Exchange in Los Angeles. And she was like, oh man, I want to play your game, but it looks really tough and like a thing I can't do and uh, really complicated. And I'm like, no, it's not complicated. It's just a game. You can play it. And I told her how to play, and just pushed her over, and within 30 seconds she was just making perfect shots and screaming at everybody. And it was great. And this, this is from PAX East over there, those guys. They're uh, a group of friends from, who came up from Mexico, and they were all between like 35 and 55, because we asked, and they were all super into it and played five times in a row. Um, yeah, my like kids came over with their parents to, to, to thank me for making this game. So I've been trying to figure out, like, what do you do with this? Um, so, uh, couples as well. Here's Jerry Hulkins from Penny Arcade playing it with um, just some lady that he didn't know. And then you can see the long-haired people are a couple, and they were just destroying them every time. Uh, and, uh, oh yeah, and Shane's dad, Shane is a Necrosoft programmer, he had never touched a controller before. He's in his 60s, and uh, Shane just forced the controller into his hand, and then he's like, uh, he became good at it just immediately. And so we're trying to figure out why this is. Um, so Sabine, from, uh, who's the maker of uh, Can't Touch This, if you're familiar with that, from the Copenhagen Game Collective. Uh, she played this game at a party in Vienna and said that she wanted to show it to her friend who was just discovering feminism. Uh, and I was like, why? What, what, what about this game makes you feel that way? And she said, because the ladies were all cool and sassy and powerful and, on, and everybody was just on equal footing without being sexualized and <clears throat> hadn't really thought about it that to that extent. Like that we were we weren't really trying to do that. <clears throat> so how did it happen? Um, 
like I said, we didn't set out to make a feminist game. We didn't set out to make a game for everyone. But I think that the choices we made along the way made it more natural for this to happen. <clears throat> for example, the control and mechanics choices did level the playing field more. So when you have the triggers on the end of the controller and the fire button as your control mechanic, that's not a thing that most games do. So for people that don't play a lot of games, they, uh, they um, don't have to remap what their brain expects from a controller experience when they do it. So I just explain it to them and they're like, okay, that's how this works. But the kind of 18 to 25 year old Call of Duty player wants right trigger to be shoot. And for them, it's a little more confusing. So it actually wound up like making things more even at the start for everybody. Because you had some people learning the controls and you had other people relearning the controls and it sort of normalized. Um, there was actually a, a particularly interesting episode that happened at the PlayStation Experience. There was a, uh, a man who came over with his wife and he was really drunk. He was like, yeah, I want to play your game. And uh, I had to force his wife to play too. And she's like, I don't really want to play. I'm bad at games. And he said, yeah, she's really bad at games. Uh, but I just put the controller in her hand, explained how to play it, and uh, she was great. And he kept blaming any time they lost points on her, but it was actually always his fault. And <clears throat> at the end of playing it, she was like, hey, I just wanted to thank you for making a game that casual players like me can play. But we didn't. We just explained it carefully and without being a jerk. And then she was just she was just able to do it because nobody had said, yeah, of course you can play this game. It's just a game. <clears throat> um, I think the choice to make everybody in the game look cool was important because we, like, like I said, we didn't do it for feminist reasons necessarily, but you want to have variety, so men and women, that's a good variety to have. Uh, you want everybody to be cool, and since it's a sport, you want them to be cool in a powerful way rather than in a sexy way or something. So it was just a natural extension of making the game the way that you would logically make it. <clears throat> and I think also the fact that it was cooperatively competitive is helpful. Because when you don't have to succeed or fail by yourself, it feels better. It feels like you've got a potential safety net there. Um, but it also could just be the way that I show it to people, which is worrisome to me, because I'm not going to be able to show everybody this game in their house, uh, necessarily. Um, because I just tell everybody that they have to play it and then explain carefully how to do it. And I explain the controls to everybody. Like, I was at EVO in uh, Las Vegas, and that's, you know, the biggest fighting game convention in the world. And even there, I was like, okay, no, the, the, the triggers of those things, right there on the end of the controller. Um, these people who could destroy me in Street Fighter didn't know where the triggers were. Uh, whoops. And... We also noticed that once we convinced one person who was not a traditional gamer to play it, then a whole bunch of other people would be more interested in it. So at that Vienna party, for example, um, Sabine was interested in playing it, but there was a group of four girls that I was like, hey, there are four of you, come play this game. And they are like, no, 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 it's not really my thing, I can't really do it. But then once they saw Sabine playing three rounds, then suddenly they came over and they were interested because they, they're like, okay, so this, this isn't just a boys club or something. <clears throat> but ultimately, maybe it's just that we didn't suck as bad as everybody else. Uh, we didn't just, we just weren't jerks or something. Uh, it's hard to say, but there actually may be something to the idea that <clears throat> since so many games are representing different groups of people, so poorly that just doing a slightly better job gets more notice, uh, which is sad, but that may be the truth. So what do we do about this now? Uh, I don't know. I really want to keep this going forward, though, because the more people that are playing games, 
the more people that are playing competitive games, the better. Um, and it's hard to get new groups of people to play a game like Street Fighter because there's such a high barrier at the start that you can't you can't just slide into it and make it happen. So having a game with fewer mechanics to it and fewer rules might be kind of a gateway to more people playing competitive games, which I think is really interesting because it's going to vary the tactics and vary the playing field in general for competitive video games, which is important. So I guess we're going to try to convey some of this stuff in videos and uh, show lots of people playing it like it did in this talk here. Um, and I've started getting advice, like once I realized this was happening, which has really only been in the last few weeks, I've started to try to ask people why this game works for them. Which is weird, because usually they don't know, but I can gather some data from that. But uh, yeah, we're just going to try to make sure that the things that we've already done, we continue to do and do well. Um, like having a wide variety of bodies and human types in the game, all being cool, all doing cool stuff. But that's, that's like what you want anyway. So it's, it's weird to say that it's a success when it's just the baseline of what you should do, probably. Um, that's pretty much it.